Good morning. Good morning and welcome to our event on powering Africa and promoting just energy transition. Before we start, a little bit of logistics. There will be two segments to our event today. We will start with a keynote speech from Axel von Trossenberg, the managing director of the World Bank. After the keynote, we will go to the panel discussion where we will hear from honorable ministers about their experiences and lessons from expanding energy access in sub-Saharan Africa. We will also zoom on challenges that need to be overcome, innovations that are pursued, and how can public and private sector work together to deliver universal energy access in sub-Saharan Africa. With that, I have the pleasure to welcome Axel Van Trostenberg, Managing Director of the World Bank, to deliver his keynote intervention. Axel, please. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Ricardo. Uh, welcome, everybody, to this uh, rather important session about powering Africa. Um, it, is, um, it is in the last couple of days we have talked a lot about our new series of studies linking climate and development together, and that you cannot look at climate and development in a separate way. And where is this most prominently is in the energy sector. Energy uh, access is at the heart also of development. It provides the opportunities for economic growth, yet we have still challenges. Today, about 733 million people still lack electricity worldwide. Three quarters of them are living in Africa. And about close to 40, 50% still have no access uh, of the, uh, to uh, electricity in Africa. And that means that all the potentials that they, uh, that people normally would have are being denied to hundreds of millions of Africans. And you see it in the healthcare centers. In Africa, two thirds are lacking access to electricity. We see that in Sub-Saharan Africa, 30 to 40% of the food is, 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 is lost because it cannot reach market, partly also uh, uh, to the lack of irrigation, and that requires electricity. And so the overall losses are in some countries sometimes estimated in the order up to 4% of GDP, and that is simply not acceptable. Now progress is being made. About 30 million people every year are getting access to electricity in Africa. And that is the good news. The not so good news is that actually 80 million should have. So we actually need to triple our joint effort to make it happen. Now then you say that's a tall order. I would argue it can be done. We have seen that in elsewhere in the world, I'm thinking of Vietnam, that went through a revolution and increased very rapidly energy access. The good news is it's also happening in Africa. And I'm thinking here of Rwanda that in 15 years went from 6% electrification to 60%. And you also see very encouraging uh, uh, progress in the electrification uh, in Kenya and Uganda. So how can we actually generalize that in the Africa? So we need to do more. And, and, and that means actually how can we get universal access to 2030? That's a hugely ambitious uh, 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 goal, but it can be there. I think what we have to think about is we can, we can no longer think only of a little project here and there. We will need to have an Africa-wide effort in which basically piecemeal approaches are being replaced for a strategic approach to see how um, basically the overall uh, governments, private sector, international uh, uh, organizations like the World Bank can actually work together and find solutions of grid and off-grid solutions. This is 
possible. It will require, of course, enormous political uh, commitment. But I would argue that also the declarations by the African Union, but also during our negotiations for the latest IDA 20 round, were very encouraging. Last July, we had actually an implementation summit that was attended by 14 uh, heads of state in Dakar, and that was hosted by President uh, Macky Sall, and that touched also on the electricity challenge. And what you get a uh, uh, feeling is that it, there is a lot of political commitment to make it happen. So we need to, to build on that, and, and that means we need to see how we can mobilize. Now, everybody needs to do his or her share. And I think what we have seen is that if you are looking at uh, the World Bank activities, we have currently an upper, a, a portfolio of about $8 billion. And once this is fully implemented, we believe that about 75 million people can get more access. So keep that in mind. I just mentioned we need to triple, so to get 80 million. So basically, the World Bank project could maybe do one year. But we need to get actually to 550 million people to, to, uh, to do it. So we need a lot more resources, including more resources from the World Bank. Um, we have actually, the good news is that in the next three years, we would like to invest in Africa with IDA resources up to $65 billion. So it's an important strategic question for uh, the governments, how much of these resources should be directed to energy access? We think there should be quite a bit of, of resources because it's important. Now, we need then to think not only within national boundaries, but also regionally and that basically there is interconnectivity. I think there are a couple of very encouraging developments going on. That is particularly, the, West, for example, the West Africa power grid, a very good uh, East Africa is working. More needs to be, more deepening needs to be. And then also a very good development of off-grid solutions, uh, small hydro, I'm thinking of the DRC. So what we need to see is we cannot uh, think one th size fits all. We will need to have different solutions uh, to, uh, to, uh, be brought to the table. That requires, therefore, very clear policies from government, and that is what, what, what will create the certainty for the investments, for the public investments, but also, also realizing that the challenge is high, we need to work with the private sector. In the case of the World Bank Group, we have the IFC and Amiga involved in it. They are stepping up their engagement. And for example, uh, just as an, uh, as an example where things are going, two days ago, uh, the, uh, the bank created this decentralized access with renewable energy scale-up, there, there is a platform, and that aims to double the, uh, the path of energy access with decentralized renewable energy technology by 2026. And, and, and that could, again, benefit we expect up to 100 million people. We need all this kind of thing, so we need to see how can we use the private sector, and if there are too many risks, we have created the private sector win a window to help de-risk these investments. And uh, the IDA has available for that purpose up to two and a half billion dollars, and I think it would be great if that uh, 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 window could be extensively used for uh, energy uh, access uh, purposes. So just to conclude, we feel actually bullish about this. I think it can be done. We see that countries are doing it. It will require an uh, not only a doubling, a tripling, maybe quadrupling of efforts. Where the World Bank is sitting, 
we are willing to quintuple our efforts on this. What I think is extremely important that not uh, in the next couple of years we can all sit here together and say we did it. And the thing is that I believe that these are the type of things we can do. We can do it in a smart way, not because we are discussing here at the COP27 uh, uh, climate. That doesn't mean that, it, that energy access is exclusive, that we cannot do that. We need to combine it, we need to do it smart, and I think Africa has all the potential to, to succeed on this. What we would like to be part of, of a very ambitious agenda to make it happen, and hopefully we can indeed scale these investments as rapidly as possible so that indeed people finally get the access to energy they so desperately deserve. Thank you very much. Axel, thank you very much indeed. In addition, because I know that uh, yours were not a well-delivered word in a speech, but they are facts. I know very much how much, I know very much how much you push for this agenda within the bank. So it's a big thank you because words must be followed by deeds. You made a very good point about the unacceptability of the situation where 52% of people in sub-Saharan Africa do not have electricity. It is totally an agenda that can be done together with the agenda on uh, energy transition and both together make the just energy transition. So without further ado, a very, very much thank you. Now I'm very excited to welcome a panel of very distinguished speakers who will shed the light on these questions. And they're very diverse in terms of their experience. So let me start as a gentleman from the Honorable Minister Ruth Nankabirwa Sentamu, the Minister of Energy and Mineral Development of Uganda. Welcome. Then the Honorable Minister Godi Jedi Akba is represented today by the engineer Kinsley Odo, Special Advisor to the Honorable Minister, and we are lucky to have Kinsley here. So welcome. Uh, Rene Van Hel, the Director of Inclusive Growth at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands. Rene, it's always good to see you. And last but not least, a friend, Ken Peters, who is the head, the executive director of GOGLA. GOGLA is the association of off-grid solar sector. Ken, thank you very much to be here as well. So let me start with the Honorable Minister from Uganda. Minister, Uganda has achieved a rapid increase in the pace of electrification in recent years. What lessons can you share with other countries and what are new areas you are working on now, please? Thank you very much and good morning to you all. You'll pardon my voice. It's losing out as we move ahead with COP27. Um, Uganda started by making sure that we have electricity generated. So we focused on generation and we invested money into generation from the rivers that we have. And as I speak now, our installed capacity rose from 100 megawatts in 1986 to date where we have 1,500 megawatts generated in, in, this is the installed capacity. But we have more power which is going to come on board when we commission Karuma hydropower, generating 600 megawatts. In December, we are going to bring on board 200 units from Karuma. And we have other plants that can generate 840 megawatts, 400, 392, where we are looking for money. Secondly, we had to plan for evacuation, a transmission uh, infrastructure and we accepted deemed energy provisions in our production sharing agreements just to comfort the investors that all the power that will be generated will be taken by government. 
now we are at the stage of uh, enhancing the distribution network. We allowed private in investor to have the distribution network. The main distributor is, of course, Umeme, that is having a concession which is ending in 2025, and it's not going to be renewed because we have built capacity. But we have other distributors in different corners in the country that help. Thirdly, we encourage mini grids in the islands, in the far reaching communities. You can establish renewable energy, solar power. We have brought solar power on board as well. Then the last thing is the privatization that we um, took on as a policy, where we removed the monopoly in generation monopoly in transmission, monopoly in distribution. You can generate power and sell it direct to the consumer, as I speak now. And this is the newest policy that we've come across, that we have uh, put in place. So with the help of World Bank now, and uh, I must appreciate, we are going to see uh, hundreds of thousands of new connection. Um, there are people who, already, who are already established. They, they are using the certified wiremen or wire persons to make sure that when an opportunity comes, you just connect. The free connection policy also enhanced the access to electricity. Free connection policy. We suspended it because free is not free. <laughs> there is no free lunch. Of course, government has to buy the connection materials for people to get the connection free, but it is not free. They pay indirectly, they have to pay. We suspended it, but with the new uh, loan facility coming on board from World Bank, we are going to embark on this new free, uh, free connection uh, policy. And I think this will help us to in increase our connectivity. We will remain with the issue of affordability because the tariffs are still high. So this is an area which we have to focus on, affordability of this clean energy that we are trying to take to the people. Yeah. Honorable Minister, thank you very much. You remind us what is the SDG number seven. So energy must be secure, reliable, must be affordable, must be clean, must be modern. Affordability is a key part of it. So thank you very much indeed. Let me now know, go to engineer Kinsley Odo. Uh, Kinsley, uh, Nigeria has a large unelectrified population, especially in the rural areas. What are the strategies of the federal government of Nigeria in deploying to reach universal access with grid and off-grid technology and how do you see the role of private sector in this process? Thank you very much, Ricardo. Um, first, um, apologies from my minister. Um, he's, supposed to, he's supposed to be here, uh, but um, he got tied up with a lot, lots of things happening here at COP. He's here, and uh, he holds this gathering, you know, um, very highly, and so he sends his apologies. And he also sends his regards. Um, and thanks for having me. Um, it's a pleasure. Um, I know a lot of you worked with all of you, worked with um, Ashish and uh, some of you back, back in Nigeria. That said, to the question. Um, so Nigeria is a very unique country with over 200 million people. So you can see the diversity in terms of how to cater to the energy needs of that diverse nation. Today we have an installed capacity of about 13 gigawatts. Um, um, so 13 gigawatts grid connection. But we did an analysis of the entire um, gener uh, generated capacity either captive, embedded, and all of that, 
Uh, KPMG did that study for us, and we have over 20 gigawatts of energy. It's about 27 there about. Um, but utilization is always the, the key issue. What goes downstream? And so um, today we average about five gigawatts, four points, you know, it just swings up and down. Yeah, so the question is, how do you provide electricity downstream, rural communities? Um, so that had been uh, a topical challenge for us. And so uh, Nigeria, knowing how diverse the nation is, we uh, formed a, a government agency called Rural Electrification Agency. Now because, um, like you rightly mentioned, um, the energy penetration is about 53%, thereabout, and in the rural communities, unserved and underserved, about 35% thereabout. So it's always a challenge to have access in these communities. Now, you must understand that um, if you don't provide access, then there's gonna be a lot of other rippling effects. For example, medical issues in the rural communities, um, maternal uh, and children's mortality, and all of those things wrapped in them, those challenges begin to occur. So um, Nigeria f um, structured what you call the Rural Electrification Agency, and the World Bank had partnered with us, I mean, across the value chain. Now, the generation infrastructure is fully privatized, um, even though government still has a few of the um, hydros. For example, uh, the recent hydro that will be commissioned before the end of this year, 700 megawatts Zungeru. To add to this, there is another Kashimbila, about 40 um, uh, megawatts, and all of those coming on, on stream will stabilize our grid. The strategy for us is to have a very stable base load provision, and then we'll now integrate um, the um, mini SCADA, I mean mini grids and off grid solutions, which um, World Bank had partnered with us a great deal. Now we have the NEP program, which is um, um, Nigeria Electrification Program, which um, phase one, World Bank provided about 350 million USD, I think in conjunction with AFDB. And so that's phase one, and phase one is winding down, but a lot of things have happened because we've got um, over a million connections since we started and 2.5 million households you know in the rural communities plus the um, underserved communities as well so the penetration is on and we're saying look this is a good thing happening uh, thanks to World Bank we own the projects but great assistance from World Bank and all the all our multilateral and bilateral partners um, so we want to take it the next to the next level because the momentum we've built is quite impressive. And we're saying, how do we move on to the next level? And so we're saying, the good thing we, we're hearing is that NEP 2.0 would come on stream, and that NEP 2.0 would provide an average of about 750 million USD. That's fantastic. But because of the strategic nature of Nigeria, we think that World Bank should look at it very seriously and really put, I heard the, the group managing director, right? The World Bank group. Yeah. Uh, he, he mentioned that, I mean, they're quite aggressive in this. They want to quadruple. We want to quadruple as well, yeah? Fantastic, so we're working as a team. And therefore, it's important to see that we need to scale up, especially because there is already something good happening. And if we scale up this uh, in a way that we we put even in phases of a $2 billion uh, line to deal with this in their phases of $750 million per phase, that would be exciting. Now, so, um, but the good thing is that the penetration is, is good. We've done lots of projects. So we have, yes, I know, I'm wrapping down, yeah? We have, <laughs> we have the... Um, the uh, energizing universities as part of this program. We've got the um, 
agro, um, where we've done so well, also in the rural communities. We've also done in, we're trying to do rooftops, solar home systems. I mean, the list just goes on and on. And so this partnership is crucial and critical for us. And we think that together we can win. Thank you very much. No, th thank you, Kingsley. Thank you very much. Believe me that the partnership is key to us as well. And you made a very, very good point. It is very important to address the urban rural divide because it's very high, but it's also very important to think about providing electricity to urban communities. And it will be partly on grid, partly off grid. In our calculation in Africa, it will be more in sub-Saharan Africa, it will be around 60% on grid and 40% off grid due to the density of the population, of course. So a monumental thank you. And now I go to Rene uh, from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands. Rene, we want to quadruple. Nigeria wants to quadruple. Are you going to quadruple together with us? A absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Axel just said that he felt bullish, and uh, I'm always glad when Axel feels bullish, but I'm really feeling bullish when I listen to the, 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 the ambition of the Minister of Uganda and the representative Nigeria. So I think this is where we like to partner. Um, of course, it took a while, but now finally also the European Union is taking aggressive action against greenhouse gas pollution. And it's really our strong belief that we can only go towards to a global net zero goal if we, uh, at the same time, and at least as aggressively, also work on universal access to energy. Because it's, it's taking too long, and it's, and it's, and it's, 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 it's not just. It is not what, 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 what the world needs. Africa needs so much more energy. Africa needs so much more economic growth also, and that's where we would like to partner. Uh, so one of the things that the government has done is that, I, is that we have doubled our goal. Our goal was always to, to help uh, five, zero, 50 million people in, in countries in Africa with access to clean energy or clean cooking, and we've doubled that goal. And also, and now I would like to be precise, so, um, so we will double the contribution to our energy access programs, uh, such as NDEF, and uh, we will, of course, also work with IFC and FMO to mobilize the needed private capital. Um, and also today, I'm glad to announce that we intend to, to double our contribution to ESMAP. Um, it's the program, of course, of the World Bank that we're very close to and that we very much believe into. The reason why we do this is to really support the DARES initiative that we discussed today. And this means an additional 70 million US dollars through, uh, through the World Bank until 2030. And together we think that working through DARES will also enable us to reach 300 million people with access to electricity. And thereby we make a serious dent in, in closing this access gap that's, um, that we all need to work on. So, so thank you for this question. Rene, hey. I have to thank you. I have to <laughs> it's me who thank you. I mean, I'm, I'm very proud and also <laughs> humbled by, by this. I mean, thank you so much. We really have to work together if we want to get there. And the Netherlands, to be honest, has always been on our side. So thank you. I like deeds more than words. So thank you so much. Kern, you represent the off-grid solar, a lot of private sector. We've been working together many years, even that during the pandemic was more difficult. How do you see private sector really coming in? The Netherlands is doing a great job. I would argue that World Bank Group is doing a great job. The countries are doing an amazing job. We need the private sector. How do you see that? How can we get more? Yeah, thanks, uh, Ricardo. And I'm really glad to, to be here on this, uh, this panel. Thank you very much. Um, for your panel, it would have been better if I strongly disagreed with some of your views, but I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to, uh, to add my few two cents and say that everybody's doing uh, great work uh, here. Um, so I represent the off-grid solar industry. We've got around 200 members uh, all together. Um, the industry has reached about close to a half a billion people right now with off-grid solar products, which is quite an amazing number given that the, the entire industry really took off about 12 years ago. Um, but it's not enough. Uh, the number is not enough. The quality of access that people get through these products is also not enough. We need to get better 
quality of access to these, uh, the, these people. Um, we set for ourselves um, a target to reach 1 billion people by 2030. That is 1 billion people that get better energy access, but in, we here at COP, that's also 1 billion people that become more climate resilient, that have better access to information, that can, better, um, uh, can have better power to uh, uh, power their, their communication, uh, to create opportunities for, for, for job creation, to get power for water pumping, for cold storage. Um, so there's a, an immediate and urgent climate relevance. Um, for mitigation, for adaptation, and for uh, climate, uh, climate justice. Uh, just three weeks ago, we organized our biannual uh, get-together for the off-grid uh, solar industry, which is a, uh, was always a feast uh, to, uh, to come together, but we do that always together with the World Bank, actually. We've inherited this series of events from the World Bank and, uh, and IFC, and it's been a fantastic uh, cooperation uh, for all those years. Um, this year, when we took stock of the state of the industry and compared it with two years, two and a half years ago, COVID delayed us uh, a little bit, um, what was remarkable to me is the quality of public-private partnership that we've seen develop over the last uh, uh, two, two years. We heard examples in our e e uh, event, we dived a little bit deeper on the case of Rwanda because the event was in, in Kigali, but also Nigeria because Nigeria is really standing out now as a leader in that public-private uh, uh, partnership and uh, I asked uh, my guest, the managing director of the Rural Electrification Agency and the state sec um, um, the permanent secretary of, uh, of Rwanda, whether they f found that they have now more or less nailed it, that they have really figured it out, the, uh, the cooperation, and whether they felt that the industry was also delivering its part. And the feedback I got was, yes, they feel that uh, they have really nailed it right now after 10 years of hard working and, uh, and learning and with great support from the, the, the World Bank to, uh, uh, to get there. And that was a real optimistic story um, that, uh, that tells me we, uh, we should be optimistic about um, doubling, tripling, quadrupling the, uh, the speed of growth in the, uh, the industry if we can replicate these stories to other countries, which is not going to be easy because this is about building a nuclear submarine, the fact that we've built one or multiple across the world doesn't make it easy to build the next one. Um, we also looked at is the industry ready then to work with um, the World Bank and governments when all these uh, public-private partnership programs uh, develop. Um, it's a bit of a mixed bag. Um, the industry is not profitable enough as it uh, wants to be and had hoped to be a few years ago. Um, some are. Uh, but across the, the, uh, the space, we also have to recognize the industry is selling products to the, uh, the poorest and most remote customers uh, on the planet, uh, where the alternative uh, uh, solutions have always been high, highly subsidized and filled to, to reach those, uh, those customers. Um, it's entirely fair to recognize we need to work more with public sector to address um, issues of um, uh, profitability of the industry, which are directly coupled with affordability. I heard from a minister from Uganda, affordability on the front of her mind. It's on the front of the mind of the industry uh, as well. The price settings of the products that we can offer to customers is the, the most important determinant for how much the, mar the industry sells. Um, and it's, it's crucial. And everybody is trying to get that price point lower sustainably. Uh, so that we can reach, uh, uh, reach more, more people. So that's also an element where the, the health of the industry and the affordability of the products where we as an industry want to work more with, uh, um, uh, with, with public sector um, and with perhaps uh, uh, climate, uh, climate finance. And then the third element that stuck out is the in increasing diversification. Um, both World Bank and Gogla have been focusing in the first few years of this emerging of the industry on household electrification. Uh, increasingly we're looking at better household electrification but also at electrification beyond households for productive use, um, for e-mobility, e uh, connection with, with cooking which is, which is household again but that productive use and the electrification of public institutions is of course uh, crucial uh, because we can't stop with, uh, with households. Um, so when I heard uh, quintupling of the World Bank uh, effort I thought about the effort that we already see from the World Bank and I think Wow, that will be something, quintupling that. Uh, I really look forward uh, to that. Um, we really love that special relationship and the special partnerships that we have with governments and with World Bank and the industry. And it's the, the part that makes me really upbeat about the, uh, the future.
Con, thank you very much indeed. I mean, you raised so many important questions. One of them is really, we cannot go deal by deal. We cannot have this artisanal approach. We will have to, to learn to, bind, to bunch. We will have to learn to scale up, to standardize, make sure we can move faster. And it, and it takes all of us, as a matter of fact. So, and, and also another good point is not only about households, households is, around, is about businesses, about public buildings, is about clean mobility. So it is a lot of work to be done. And electrification is key. By the way, at the World Bank, we really want the digitalization of sub-Saharan Africa. This is not possible without electricity. So really, we have to move very strongly. But now, please. Uh, we, have, we are lucky to have Minister Matola of Malawi. So, uh, Minister, I would kindly ask you to say a few words about Malawi. What are your plans for electrification, please? Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'm very glad from what I've heard from all the presenters, my colleagues, from Nigeria, uh, Uganda, and Netherlands, and the all participants here. I'll start by saying that uh, this journey, we need to move together without leaving anybody behind. But also I'll quote an African proverb, which says, one hand cannot clap. We need support from each and every body in this sector. Malawi has one of the lowest electricity access rates in the world. Currently, the electricity access rates stands at 18% with severe disparates between urban, which is 42%, and the rural area, 4%. But also, we depend a lot on hydro. And on the 24th of January this year, we were hit badly by Cyclone Anna, where we ended up losing 130 megawatts from one station. And to make matters worse, too, that most of our hydropower plants are lying under one river, which is also not good for energy security. We need to diversify. We need also to think outside box. The government of Malawi has set an ambitious goal of achieving universal access by 2030. To reach this goal, the annual connection rate must approach 600,000, all 10 times the current rate. In this regard, Malawi requires all feasible means to expand access to electricity, including grid densification, grid expansion, off-grid solar home systems, and many grids. The grid component requires our national utility company to provide superior execution in order to connect households at a much faster rate. Several measures have been made and taken place in this regard. Number one. Our national utility, ESCOM, is investigating ways to increase efficiency. Second, we are committed to reform programs to increase the effectiveness of public procurement and to strengthen the financial capacity of the national utility to deliver access programs. Thirdly, where it takes sense, we are considering outsourcing certain connection activities to provide sector companies. Malawi is under 
the regional interconnector SAP, Southern Africa Power Pool. However, Malawi was not yet connected to the Southern Power Pool. It pleased His Excellency, the President, President to interact with his counterpart, the Mozambican president, President Nyusi, and we are going to be tapping 100 megawatts from Mozambique. Then there is also an initiative which we are negotiating with the Tanzanian government that will be tapping from Tanzania. That's the TAMA, Tanzania and Malawi interconnector. The third one, we are also neighboring with Zambia. We are thinking of tapping from Zambia into Malawi, which is also Zama connector, the Zambia-Malawi interconnector. With these initiatives, I think we are going to achieve the access to electricity in the term of regional integration. The problem we have in Africa is that we do these projects as a national project. But let's think about regional integration. When Zambia have funding and we also as a neighboring, we are going to benefit. But when we take as the national uh, program or projects, then they die natural death. But we need to go into regional integration so that we can achieve the much needed purpose and even putting the pool funds together because these countries or the rivers or the sources of green energy are very, very connected to each other. We anticipate that the off-grid connection will play a major role in our electrification efforts. According to our, our analysis, by 2030, more than 25% of all connections in Malawi will be provided by off-grid providers. My ministry, in two months' time, will launch a solar market development fund jointly designed with the, and financed by the World Bank to provide result-based financing and grant to solar companies in order for them to scale up affordable solar system programs. Mini-grid is in its infancy of development in Malawi, and we need your support. There is no way I can get sanctions as Malawi from Zambia in terms of blocking the sun. There's no way I can get sanctions from Tanzania in order to block us not to have wind. These are the blessings from God. And there's no way. But other sources of energy, the escalation of prices, scrambling into diesel, there are a lot of politics in it. But when it comes to these natural resources, God-given, there is no way Malawi can also not have the sun shine. When Tanzania is having it, when Zambia is having it, Malawi also too would benefit. So we need to move into this mini solar grid system. Mini grid, it is an infant development in Malawi, as I said, with the recent launch of feasibility study to access 10 potential mini grid sites. We believe it will take off. What I would like to emphasize in my closing remarks is that I should mention that countries like Malawi are confronted with formidable financing obstacles. We estimate that achieving universal access will require at least 3 billion US dollars. And we are currently implementing 150 million US dollars Malawi Electricity Access Project, MAP, funded by the World Bank. The project will help us increase the rate of access from 
to 30%. More financing is needed to come from other donors and international finance institutions. I thank you very much. So without further ado, we close this panel. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister, reminding us of the threat of, uh, of, of the need to work on adaptation and resilience, regional integration. But without further ado, a big, big thank you to all of our panelists. So thank you very much. Thank you, Axel. Goodbye. Thank mm -hmm. you.